Well, good morning and happy new year. It's, it's a new year, a new day, a new wonder, and same old virus. But, uh, welcome. Our prayer focus this week is everyone who's been affected by this virus. It's been kind of a devastating two years. I'm praying that this last wave is the last dying gas of the virus, that it's reached that stage that's kind of like motorcycle driving. It's not if you've had an accident, it's when you're going to have an accident. The virus is now not if you're going to contact, it's when you're going to come into contact with it. And if you've been vaccinated and all that and doing good, hopefully it'll be just a mild little thing or you won't have any symptoms at all. But hopefully by the end of January, this will be gone throughout the country and we can move on to something else. Uh, if you could sign the attendance hats and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. Um, we're having communion today. Did everybody get their communion element? If you didn't, raise your hand and uh, Shauna will bring it to you. Does anybody here not have it? Looks like everybody has it. Great. Uh, the nomads are here. If you saw the RVs out there, they are here to come work and to do service in our community. We thank them. They were here at the first service and introduced themselves. So they'll be hanging around for three weeks. So thank you. Some will be here longer. Uh, the church office is going to be closed tomorrow for New Year's Day, a little late, but we're going to celebrate it tomorrow. So we'll have our prayer on Tuesday, which is always when we have a holiday on Monday, we try and pray on Tuesday, which makes it hard for people to remember like me. So, but if you can come on Tuesday morning, I'll be here. I've put my note out and we will pray. Uh, the flower calendar is available for 2022. If you go through the double doors there, you'll see it on the right on the uh, bulletin board there if you would like to sign up for flowers for any particular Sunday in honor or memory of something or just because you wanted to do it. And we do have our offering envelopes for those who use them in the back. So if you could pick those up because we're going to mail them in a couple weeks and they're kind of heavy to mail and it saves us some money. So with that, um, that's our announcements, and so let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Amen. Let us stand for our call to worship. Arise, shine. Arise, shine, for our light has come. And glory, glory has risen on us. Let us lift up our eyes and look around. And we might see. Let's remain standing for our opening hymn, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. We come now to that time where we lift up our prayer requests and our praises. Any, any praises this morning? Wow, that's quick. <laughs> Only 20 minutes in the ER, that is. Well, it was in the health system, so I'm right for the health Yep. Yes. I have family here, and I have more Mormon kids coming in on Tuesday. Sadran says she's got family here, they're in the back there, and she's got more on the way getting here Tuesday. So that'll be a celebration. Yes? We were on a cruise recently, and um, you know, you eat in the main dining room, there's a lot of people around eating with you. And we always, no matter where we're at, we bow our heads and, and say our prayer silently, but we just decided we'd, we'd speak it out loud, but softly. And when we got finished, the couple next to us, they said thank you. It was so refreshing. Yes, it is. Our witness is out there. Yes. I want to praise Jim Bursey, who found my wife's cell phone. So, on Christmas Eve, she lost her cell phone, and Jim Bursey helped locate it. So that's a praise, because they're expensive to replace. And your planes were on time. Uh, not everybody was that lucky, I've heard. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Well, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this day, we come here thankful that you are our God, thankful for the blessings you give us, thankful for the guidance you give us, thankful that you left heaven in all the wonder and glory and honor there and came to earth to be like one of us, to struggle, to have to earn a living, to have to learn a trade, to have to learn to walk, to cry, to laugh, to love. We thank you that you know our experiences. You know who we are. And you love us. And so we come this morning praising your name, thanking you that you are our God. And Lord, as we come here this morning, we pause and remember those that are hurting. We especially lift up the people in Kentucky, Lord, who are dealing with so much with the storm that just came through right after having a severe storm just a few weeks ago. So Lord, be with all of those that are dealing with this, those that are grieving, those that are homeless, those that just don't know what the future holds. Lord, restore them. And to the many people, Lord, that are offering to come and that are coming there, bless them, guide them so that their help might be effective and they might have touched people's lives and changed people's lives. Lord, help us all to come together to help those who are in need. And Lord, we do lift up all of those that are dealing with this virus. We especially lift up our healthcare workers who are on the front line, who many are tired. And Lord, bless them and give them strength as they, as they help to heal as they do what they can to comfort. And so, Lord, bless them and bless all who have the virus, Lord. Help them to heal quickly. And, Lord, let this virus just quickly run its course so that we might continue to live our lives in praising you and in reaching out to others, helping others. And, Lord, we lift up all of those that are on our prayer list and ask that you touch them as only you can. And even now, Lord, we lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, as we enter this new year, we look forward to another year of serving you, loving you, giving of our time and talents. And Lord, we want to walk in your way and your will. We want to surrender to our ways. So Lord, help us this year to walk closer with you, to serve you better, to love you more, to find what it is that you are calling us to do, to do it, to find the blessings you have for us to walk in your ways and your will, Lord. And Lord, we can only do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we're thankful that you've sent your Holy Spirit to us to guide us, to lead us, 
to hear our prayers and so that we might hear your words back to us. We thank you for this precious gift. And Lord, we now close this prayer in the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I think our children would head off now if they are going, but I don't see very many, so we'll continue worshiping.
Thank you, Elizabeth, that was so wonderful. Thank you for sharing your talent with us. We come now to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings, and thank you so much for your support of the church. I think, we haven't seen the final numbers yet, but because we got a, we were off last week, <laughs> so we didn't put everything in, but I think we might have ended in the black. We won't know until a little bit, but it's gonna be very close, and that's because of your faithfulness. But part of that also is that we're gonna probably end in the black is because we didn't do as much last year as we planned. Some of the things we planned, we had to cancel because of COVID. Uh, our kids who were headed to summer camp got canceled because the staff got COVID at summer camp, so they had to cancel and things like that. So I know this year is going to be a little different that I'm, I'm praying that by the end of January, this COVID is going to be running its course out and we're going to get in a new year doing a lot of the things we did and we'll be doing things that we did in the past and so our budget expenditures are going to go up. But I'm always confident that God will give us the resources to meet our needs because for 25 years now of doing this, I've witnessed how God has blessed us when we give of ourselves to help others. I still remember the first church I served in Georgia. There were only about 30 people there and the first board meetings were always to vote what bills to pay and what bills not to pay because that's all the money they had. And then I get there as this person who's not even started seminary and says, we need to start doing these things in the community and giving ourselves away. And they said, well, we don't have anything to give away. And I said, well, we're going to give away what we don't have. <laughs> and they started giving away what they didn't have. And the more they gave away, the more God gave them to give away. And when I left them, they had over... I think thirty, forty thousand dollars in surplus, and they had done all these projects and done all these ministries. And that's what I've seen everywhere I've been, and I'm seeing it here that as we give of ourselves, as we go outside our walls and we try to bless the community we live in, God gives us money to bless that with. And He's done that over and over many different ways, and sometimes it's through the hearts of the people who attend here. So I thank you for all you do. This this last year we touched a lot of people. And this year, I know we're going to touch even more. So thank you for all you give to this church. And now as we prepare to receive our offerings, which we're not actually taking them up. You're putting them in the envelopes, I mean the baskets on the front there during COVID. So let us go to Lord in prayer. O oh God of grace and peace and joy, we thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for the calling on our lives. We thank you that you use us to touch other people, that you use us to make an impact in the lives of others, that as you bestow grace and blessings on, e on us, they're to flow through us to others, and we become a blessing to other people. Lord, help us to continue in this new year to be a blessing. As we come and present, these are tithes and offerings, Lord. Help us to use them to make a difference in people's lives. Guide us in their use. And Lord, we thank you that you have multiplied it over and over again and continue to multiply it so that we can make a difference. We pray all this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, beginning of the first verse. Hear now these words. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for you shall for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then they opened their treasure chests. They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this is the first Sunday of 2022. Usually we celebrate Epiphany Sunday, even though this is an Epiphany Day. It only happens every so often that Sunday falls on January 6th, which is the day of Epiphany at the end of Christmas time. And if you live in South America, you haven't gotten your Christmas presents yet because they don't get their Christmas presents until the day of Epiphany, January 6th. If Jesus didn't get his presents till the 6th, then you don't get yours till the 6th either. And they don't leave out cookies for Santa, they leave out hay for the camels. It's an interesting tradition they, they have down there. Well, this is the beginning of a new year. And with many years, it's a year of kind of fear and uncertainty for much of our country and many people as we're still dealing with this virus, still dealing with political unrest and who knows what. And this time of year, if we look at the Christmas story, we can get all kind of messed up about what it really means. And one of the cartoons I've always loved is the Family Circus cartoon. Uh, Bill Keene, over the years, has allowed churches to use his cartoons in their newsletters without fear of copyright violations. He gives them permission to use them because many of his uh, themes are about church, like this one cartoon where Dolly sits, on her, sits her baby brother PJ on her lap and she tells him the Christmas story. And her Christmas story goes something like this. Jesus was born just in time for Christmas up at the North Pole, surrounded by eight tiny reindeer and the Virgin Mary. <laughs> then Santa Claus showed up with lots of toys and stuff and some swaddling clothes. The three wise men and elves all sang carols, while the little drummer boy and Scrooge helped Joseph trim the tree. In the meantime, Frosty the snowman saw this star. And so goes the Christmas story according to Dolly. Well, the whole Christmas story has many things mixed up about it in our minds. And that's because we have all these cantatas and pageants and everything, and we cram everything about the birth of Christ into one hour. And we come away thinking it all happened in one hour, instead of it happening over months and even years. And the story of the Magi is an interesting one because we probably get more wrong about this than we do right, because there's really not a lot in the scripture about it. If you go around town and ask people, how many wise men were there, what answer would they give you? Three. That's the pretty traditional number that everyone gives. But if you go to scripture and you try to look, how many wise men are lifted, listed in scripture, they don't tell you. 
But yet we can even name the three wise men, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, because we're sure there were three. But scripture doesn't tell us, let alone even give us their names. What all it states is their gifts came in three forms, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we have come to call them kings. Yet the word magi that Matthew uses, the Greek word for wise man, is never translated king anywhere else. That in its form is used, in its Hebrew form used in the Old Testament and the New Testament is never translated king. It is usually translated magician or sorcerer in the sense of an illusionist or a fortune teller. And this is how it's translated in all the occurrence except for the Gospel of Matthew, where depending on your translation, it's usually rendered wise men, and a few have king. And many believe the Magi were referred to as a group of religious people known as the Magians, who lived in the East. They believed that there was a divine parallel to the earthly realm. And they spent much of time interpreting dreams and studying the stars for the signs of this divine parallel, when it would be coming. And so they came to worship Christ as a divine. Now this is just what some scholars say they were about. But really we don't know who they were, what they were about, why they came other than they saw a star and they wanted to come and pay homage to the king of the Jews. And as I said, the word magi, is, it only f find it in the New Testament in two different incidents. One here in Gos the Gospel of Matthew, and the other is in Acts. And it's translated sorcerer there, where this is how Paul describes the person who we use the Greek word magi for. Paul says, you are a child of the devil, and an enemy of everything is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Now this doesn't sound like the people who came to pay homage to the newborn king. This sounds like something altogether. In fact, Paul causes this person to become blind for a short period of time. So why the difference? Why are we translators using wise man in one spot and sorcerer, child of the devil, in another spot? What's the difference in these? Well, when we start to look at the visitation by the Magi and the whole Christmas story, we can see that certainly the visitation by the shepherds in Luke and the visitation by the Magi in Matthew did not happen on the same night. As much as we like to portray them in all of our Christmas pageants with the shepherds, the angels, and the wise men all there together in one happy moment, that's probably not the way it happened. When we start looking at scripture, we get clues to why this is probably not true. See, one of the reasons we don't think they happened the same night as we read down further in Matthew is Herod kills all the two-year-olds in Bethlehem because we read here today that he secretly called the wise men and found out, when did you see the star? And so the impression is that it's somewhere between the age of one and two that Jesus is when the wise men come. The other clue that Matthew gives us is Mary and Joseph are not at the manger. Matthew tells us in verse 11, where Matt, he says that the Magi arrived at the oikia. That's a word for house, not stable. They arrived at the house Mary and Joseph were staying in. So we know that they were no longer keeping in the, Mary, the baby in the manger, that they had settled down and decided to stay in Bethlehem for a while. And Matthew gives us two distinct reactions to the Christ child, which helps us to see why we translate the word magi as wise men in one person and sorcerer in another. See, the first reaction is of Herod and the people of Jerusalem. Matthew tells us that these travelers created quite a stir when they came into town. One translation we read tonight is they were frightened. Another says they were agitated or stirred up. And you can only imagine it must have been quite a sight when they came into Jerusalem. Because when people traveled back there, they traveled in large groups for safety so they didn't get robbed and things like that. And so it's probably 20 to 30 people in this entourage that are arriving there. And you can imagine on their camels, the clothing they're wearing is different, and everyone in the streets is stopping and looking. And when they hear why they've come, they become frightened 
because they know who Herod is. They know Herod is not expecting a child. And yet these wise men are coming to look for the king of the Jews, the newborn king of the Jews. And they know how Herod will probably react. Of course, they do get an audience with Herod. But if you come gifts bearing for the king, the king will probably see you out. But Matthew gives us this image that it was not their look that stirred up the people, but the reason for being there, to pay honor to this newborn king. And so it stirred up the people. They were agitated. They were troubled. And the Greek word there that's used, that Matthew used, can mean to agitate, to trouble, to cause one's inward commotion, to take away one's calmness of mind, to disturb one's equanimity, to disquiet, to make restless, to stir up, to trouble, to strike one's spirit with fear and dread, to render anxious or dis- be distressed. Well, I think when you look at our country, that describes it for many people. They're agitated, they're troubled, they're stirred up, they don't know what the future holds. And many people are saying our future is in danger. Our, we have a great political divide right now, and each side is saying the other side is destroying our country. Truths are being distorted and facts are being twisted. I mean, I try and keep up reading on what the virus is like, but I've got to read like 30 articles on the virus to find two sentences that give me some sort of truth so I can go on and know what is really happening because all the papers lead with the emotional, the fear, because that's where the money is to be made. But what I've said for 15, 20 years to people is, it is not our political divide. It is not these things that is destroying our country. What is destroying our country is we are simply walking away from Christ. It's our reaction to Christ that is destroying our country. See, we don't even have to be actively against Christ or God to bring down a godly society. We simply have to be apathetic about God and what is... And that's what we see in happening to our country today. We're not really persecuted as Christians. We're just simply ignored, and everyone is ignoring it. And that movement away from God is not bringing a serene peace to our country, but instead it's bringing fear and uncertainty. Oswald Chambers, who died a little over 100 years ago, noticed it. And he said this back then. He said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God... You fear everything else. And Christ said this about supporting this. He talked two different times in two different ways about how people support him or how they don't support him. One is recorded in several different gospels. Mark records it in Mark 9, 38 through 41, where we read this. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was a Baptist and not a Methodist. He wasn't one of us. Well, he didn't say that, but he did say he wasn't one of us, so we wanted to stop him. And Jesus said, don't stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus was essentially saying, stop worrying about the other denominations. We in our doctrine here as Methodists, we don't have everything right. We might think we have everything right, just like every other denomination thinks they have everything right. Our problem is we don't know what we have wrong, but we're bullheaded and going to go with it anyway. And the reason we know we don't have everything right in each denomination is because we're all divided, we're separated, we're not unified. But Jesus is saying that's okay as long as we are for God, that we're moving in the right direction, then that's okay. It's when we start having that apathy, when we stop working for Christ, that it becomes a problem. See, we're not competing against other churches for people. We are competing against the world for, for disciples. And we forget that sometimes that there are more places, there are not enough church seats for all the people in Brevard County. And Jesus later said this, as recorded in Matthew, another way he said, you're either for him or against him. 
He said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. See, what we often fail to realize is that in this war with Satan, there are only two sides. You are either with God in Christ or you are with Satan. There is no neutral like, I really don't care. Because if you don't care, then you're supporting one side or the other. We're either gathering people for Christ or we are scattering people. Someone once made this profound statement years ago. He said, if you think your present does not strengthen the church, then realize your absence is weakening the church. And that is what we've witnessed over the last 20, 30 years. People didn't think, I don't know why I go to church. It doesn't seem to make a difference. And as people have given up attending to church, our churches have become weakened. We can't do what we used to do. We don't have the resources to do what we used to do. And so people are being scattered rather than gathered. Our faith cannot be a hedge. We cannot be here today or next week or the week after saying, well, well, God might be real and heaven might be real, so I'll come to church every now and then just because it might be real and at the end of life, I want to get in there, but I'm still going to go do these other things that are earthly, that are away from God because it might not be real. This is not the way our faith can operate. This is not the way God calls us for our faith to operate. See, when love wise men, we see the other kind of reaction to God. Not that that pushes away, but that that seeks. That that is, doesn't worry about obstacles. They didn't worry that they got to Jerusalem and there was the wrong place. How many of you have gone somewhere and you go, oh, we went to the wrong town. Now we've got to pack everything up and go to some town 80 miles over there because we, we all shoot it. When they left Herod's past palace, they saw the star again and they rejoiced. And when they saw the star stop, they rejoiced again because they were seeking Christ. They didn't let obstacles get in their way. They were guided by a light that they knew would not lead them astray. And when they found Christ, they offered him gifts. And we're to offer Christ gifts. And the greatest gift we offer to Christ is ourselves, to give Christ ourselves totally and completely, holding nothing back. In 2022, will you still seek him? Will you follow Christ wherever he leads you? Will you give yourself totally to him? See, one of the things is that's what God calls us to be, totally 100% for him. From the very beginning in scripture, God tells us that he is a jealous God, that he wants our complete devotion. We see this when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments as recorded in Exodus 20, 1 through 5, where we read, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, make, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now he's not jealous and going to make our life miserable. His jealousy is there because he wants us to come to him with everything so that he can offer us the best life possible in this world. We must believe that and seek out that life in Christ, not just once, but every day of our life. It's a daily thing we do. When we wake up in the morning, we have to decide, am I for Christ today or do I have too many other things in my schedule? See, we can allow our schedule to become so packed, even with church work, that we forget to seek Christ. This is a daily thing of waking up and saying, God, I give you myself today. In everything I do, I do it for you today. I pray that this year you will let Christ be your only guiding light in this life. That you will let it dictate how you live, you love, you give, you serve. How it impacts your family. How it impacts your work, your recreation, everything about your life. Let this year be a year that you say, I want to get closer to God than I was last year. 
I want to know his love better this year than I did last year. I want to seek his peace better this year than I did last year. That's what this year is, offers us. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that when we encounter you because we're seeking you, you bless us. And you call us to seek you every day, to follow you every day, to love you every day. Lord, it's hard because this world distracts us. It derails us, gets us off rabbit trails while we go chasing this and chasing that. So Lord, help us to walk with you. Help us to be your disciples. Help us to give ourselves totally to you because we, it's impossible without your Holy Spirit. So Lord, send your Holy Spirit so that we might know it's there every day. That we might sense the Spirit speaking to us knowing that when we don't have words, the Spirit is speaking to you for us. We thank you for all these blessings. So Lord, help us to walk closer with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And one of the ways that Christ called us to remember him was through Holy Communion. Oops, gone the wrong way. Habits. It's through Holy Communion that he called us to remember this. So at this time, go ahead and take the little cup and peel off the plastic top that makes a lousy noise. I'll tell you when to take the bread and the juice so you don't have to worry about, is it now, is it now? I will instruct you. But we come to this morning knowing that this is how Christ called us to remember, how he gathered his disciples at that final meal that he had shared with them, where they had sung a hymn together. He had taught them for hours, plainly. Then after everything, well, all that was done, he did one final thing. He took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them and said, drink from you from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant which has been poured out for you and for many. And I love that Jesus adds that word for many, not just for those disciples there, but for many because we are that many. Christ mentions us that night. And he called us to remember in this way. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. A gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you, to this table, we come knowing that we don't always get it right. We do some things you didn't want us to do. We got tired, we got busy, we got lazy, and we just did some things you didn't want us to do, or we didn't do the things you wanted us to do. But Lord, you are a forgiving God. You do not condemn us, but you love us. You pick us up and say, go again. And so Lord, let everyone here know that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And in that forgiveness and grace, Lord, as we come to this, your table, make this bread and this juice be for us the body of blood of Christ. Make us one with each other and one with you in ministry to the world until we feast together at that heavenly banquet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So at this time, take the wafer, the body of Christ broken for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. And let us pray. Oh God of grace and peace and joy, we thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace. We thank you for your guiding light in our lives. Lord, help us this year to walk closer with you to know your love deeper, to know you more, to know your blessings and know the depth of everything there is to you that you love us. Help us to know that this year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand and join us in our closing hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 
As we prepare to leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand. And as you grab hold of it, know that he is not going to let go of it. He's going to walk with you in this new year. And that if you didn't get it all right last year, he says, that's okay, we'll do it again this year. So go in his love, go in his forgiveness, and walk closer with him. Amen.